Today's workshop, this is meant to be a participatory, hands-on thing. And what we're going to talk about is the difference between medieval hubs and 18th century hubs. Because this is something that people have been chatting about on our for most of the week. So, I didn't even realise, but um, the, the two harps that I've brought with me to play are kind of good examples of the difference because they're at opposite ends. So, when I, when I first started it out, I had a horrible modern lever harp thing with, with steel guitar strings that I made from a kit, and I did nothing. And I went to the, to the music shop in Oxford on the high street, and I said, I've got a harp with metal strings. And they said, well, you need this book, sir. And out came Anne's Blue, Secrets of the Gaelic Harp book, and I went out of the harp music box, and I took it home knowing nothing. And so I came, read the book, and went from there. And about a year or so later, there was a harp maker friend, and they had a Queen Mary, very rough Queen Mary copy, that was quite accurate, and its measurements were very rough in its construction. And they never played it, and I just kept I did you want to borrow it? And so I had that for, for quite a few years and I least strung it and I learned to play it. And then I, when I moved to Scotland I thought, look, I need a serious instrument rather than a, a botched up student job. And so then I commissioned this one from Davy Patton. And for me, as a kind of archaeologist with, a, with an interest in medieval and ancient things, this is the obvious thing to go, go for, the kind of the iconic medieval musical instrument all decorated and with all these cultural connections to the 15th century or earlier and the Lords of the Isles <coughs> fitted into my archaeological world. And I was very happy with that. But the working method that I had was to get the replica harp and to get the documents, the manuscripts and the early prints that have the harp music in them. Because I thought, if you can, if you can combine an accurate replica harp with manuscript facsimiles, if you do what the manuscript says on the harp, then you'll get the old tradition up and running again. And so I started working through Bunting's Graces and Manuscript 29, all, all this kind of thing. And in 20, 2006, the Harp Society commissioned Courtier to make student downhills, which were the first big Irish, 18th century Irish harps that had been done like that. And I said, well, I should have one, because I'm working on, in this Hatchie stuff, I, I'd been looking at Faith and Glaish and Scott's Lamentation and Burns' March, and I was thinking of Dennis Hatchie stuff. And so I thought I should get a downhill. Um, this, is, this is my downhill that I got in 2006. And it, and it was a kind of like a revelation, because it was different to the Queen Mary harp. And I thought, how cool, and that this is significant. And pretty soon, I kind of started splitting up my music and playing early stuff on the Queen Mary harp later stuff, especially there's a Hampstead Repertory on the down of the harp. And that split in my ideas and has carried on getting deeper and deeper. And getting the replica Queen Mary harp focused my attention on that because it's such a medieval art object. It's so gothic. It's, it's so vividly medieval. And then just last year, Natalie finished the Rose Mooney harp and I've had it at my house in Scotland since early this year. And I've, been, and I've switched to playing this as my main instrument. Not only my main big harp, I mean the poor downhill gets neglected and it's gone out on rental to a student now. But um I've been playing this harp and not the Queen Mary harp. Okay. And there's various reasons for that. One is because it's new. One is because I've got more and more interested in the late 18th and early 19th century end of the Irish harp tradition. And there's lots of this is Rose Mooney Harp. It's, it's the name of the person who we believe played on it when it was new. So I've been interested in the, in the late 18th and early 19th century end of the tradition. I'm interested in the connections with the stuff Roland's talking about, the archive recordings of pipe and fiddle. And so I'm really interested in this idea of trying to connect to the most recent parts of the carrying stream of the tradition. And then, in January of this year, I did an 1817 bicentenary ball, and I hoped to have the version really for it, but I didn't. So I had to do it on the downhill. You know, these these cultural ideas of the death of Arthur O'Neill, the, the end of Patrick Quinn's time, the harp societies, the archive recordings 
that Bowman has from the 1890s of papers who were born in the 1840s and trying to connect back. And yet at the same time, I still kind of have an interest in the most ancient things. I, I was asked to do Pictish music recently in, in Fife. And so I was thinking, oh gosh, the Queen Mary half is far too modern for that. And, you know, so, so, so my interests are going like this. And, like, and, and, and there was, at the time of the ball, I was being simultaneously asked to do the 1817 Regency ball and play Pictish lyre in the cave. And it was like, I, can't, I, couldn't, I couldn't reach the end. But, but you see, this, that's why I thought this would be an interesting, interesting session to talk about this and to give you a real go at it. And so we're going to talk in a pretty incoherent and open-ended way about these issues. And I've got some sheets to hold out as well. So, I don't, I don't even know what we should start at. Should we start with medieval or should we start with 18th century? Yes. Yes, <laughs> let's, let's start with the 18th century tradition. See, one of, the thing, one of the reasons about starting with the late 18th and early 19th century is because Edward Bunting was out there and he was chatting to the last of the old guys and recording their stuff. So this is a sheet that I prepared for just for myself. And then a couple of days before I travel over here, I, I found it on my computer and I thought, actually, this might be interesting for you guys. So. So what I've done is I've gone through at every record that I can find that describes the notes and the tuning or the range of the harp. And the, the idea of this originally was to get some idea of what, the, what was normal, what do we expect. So do you understand how this chart works? Mm -hmm. I've got two grey lines here. These mark where the sister strings are. And all of these harps, I'm assuming, have their sister G because they're all... 18th or 19th century harps. And the second grey line on its own is an octave below the sisters, and that's chronan G. Okay? And then what our source is telling us is how many strings above or below chronan or, and nakali, or what the position of chronan and nakali is on the harp. So you see the earliest is William McMurkey, and he's a Scottish piper and fiddler and harper, and he's writing in the early 18th century, and he just measures a harp, and he writes the measurements, and he says, the number of strings below Macaulay, including the lowest sister string, is, six, is 15. And so there I've written down the numbers, and, that, and my guess is that it would go down into that double G, an octave below chronan, two octaves below Macaulay. And the reason I put them in italics is because I don't actually know that, because he doesn't give the note names. It's possible he had a gap scale that went even lower. You see what I mean? It's, it's ambiguous. We know he had, he had 15 below them, including the lowest sister string on that half. And then if you look, the second one is, I've got his dinner, it's a hamp seat. And his half was made, it was the, dead, was the downhill half. And Edward Bunting gives us the complete tuning range of that. So everything is in bold, because we know exactly which notes, which strings are tuned to, so it's involved because we absolutely know that. We know about the gap in the bass. We know about the top string, we know the bottom string, we know each number. Then we've got Fanning, Charles Fanning and Black, what the Black's first name? Fanning and Black. And so Bunting tells us how many strings on their harp and how many above Macaulay and how many below Macaulay. So you can see I've marked Macaulay with X and I counted the strings above. And so you can be fairly confident that Fanning's top string is top E and that his bottom string, you don't know if his bottom string because you don't know about the disposition and tuning of the strings below Cronan. It could be gapped. I'm suggesting that his is not gapped and he has 14 below. Do you, do you see what I've done here? Do you see how this works? So, so, you, so you look down the wall and you get this impression of what's normal. And so you have, and I've also written the number below Cronan. So Dennis Hansi has three below, Fanning has seven below, Black has four below. Okay. And so you can see that I think it seems clear to me that you, it's logical to have C or G as the lowest note. It's, although it's, it's possible that they could have had it stopped on a different note. We just don't know, depending on how the gaps were disposed. Ask a question, please. What do you mean by below the front? 
Is that a person's name? Cronan is the name of the string an octave below in the chord. This is Cronan. This is Cronan. This string is grey here. Why is it Cronan? Cronan is, is um, cognate with crooning, you know, humming, murmuring. It's the, that's a, a it, mean, it means the drones string. Right, because drone that's string. also a surname. Okay, but, but but it means right. it means the drone string. Right. Yeah. Macaulay means the sister strings or the companions. Okay. These two manuscript twenty nine dispositions are from the tuning diagrams, and the tuning diagrams just go dot 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 up to the top, so you don't know how high the harp goes, but they give the complete bass range, including the gaps. So that's why I've written them in bold, because we know that these are the pictures on those harps. Okay. So this is interesting. So you've got top D, top E, two of them, two of them go to top D, one goes to top E, and one of them goes way high up to G, and one of them goes stupid high up to up to top C. But I like this that of the five we've got notations at the top, three of them are on D and E at the top. And so that's kind of Interesting, and the pepper tree seems to support that. You don't really ever need to go above that top E in the 18th century tunes. And you have these bass ranges. So, do you see what I mean? This gives us a kind of overview of what the range we expect the harp to have. So, that's just a little thing about the, about the have, range of the harp. Out of the harps, we have the first one, we have to know which one it is, and, and then it's a massive, but we don't know what's planning for that. Yeah, so this is Rose Mooney's harp, and I've tuned it. know where the gap is because he doesn't say but we know how many below Nicoli. This was this was Rose Mooney's highest string. Okay. But there are extra positions and I was doing silly Victorian music on it so I put the highest strings on. <laughs> but you don't need those for Irish music. I was doing Welsh tune that went up that high. So that's why I added the one, and I thought I'll take them off. And I thought I should leave them on in case I'm to play the Welsh tune again. <laughs> Irish music doesn't use them. So, so this is the 18th century harps. Sorry, Sam, can I ask you to put them off and put them on? I mean, there, there is um, the facility to take Oh, yes, there the, are the, the, the spaces on there. Yeah. But there's all issues to do with how you reconstruct the harp because it's smashed, and Natalie had to change the shape to make it. Oh, that's it. There's, there's, there's always questions. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but who hasn't tried a big. Oh, he thinks simply hard. Yeah. <laughs> Raise your hand if you haven't had the chance to play an 18th century harp. I've got any coloured strings on. No, of course not. Have you played one of the big harps? Yeah. When you left at the end of our class, I sat for a few minutes with Ava with that. Okay. And it was a pleasure. Have you tried it? Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Yes, I think the bigger apps are a bit clumsy to play. You need to get them rather you balanced. balance them, yeah. Mm -hmm. But I like the um, wider string spacing. Uh, but the tension is quite high, and it's almost getting towards a sort of concert harp tension, whereas the smaller harp seems to have a lot Interesting, because Barbara tension. said the opposite. She said the beats and harps have lower tension. Mm -hmm. So this, this is really interesting, this experiential thing that we have yeah. not agreement at all. Yeah. Um, from my very humble point of view, I think the sound from you one and that one there. Well, which one? No, that was very beautiful. Yes. Yes. Um, bigger ones. Yeah. A bit closed. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. Um, I guess just the wider spacing seemed to make your the, the fingertip playing just make more sense. And just like putting my hands on the different ones because I've been playing this one all week. Mm -hmm. So like feeling like the rose would be like a really like you know, like the wider spacing, I was like, yeah, that seems like it makes, yeah. it does make sense. Well, <laughs> I'm, I'm intending to agree with what Letitia said, more or less. Um, but, but, but I certainly, I mean, I find myself sometimes, I'm, I'm ashamed to say, or sorry to say, sometimes avoiding playing the middle strum because, uh, say, with the medieval harp, you've got the wider spacing and, and I'm more comfortable with yes. that. So there is a definite adjustment to playing one of these. Yes. And so much less large. They're, they're very different. It's very different, isn't it? Yes. We haven't been able to compare it to a theory because we haven't tried the medieval apps yet. No, I mean. yeah, yes, yes. But, but I think the, 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 the sound, the, the other thing that overwhelms you as an idea is that they're not very portable. You, you, you need to be like Caroline with, with Caroline and somebody who's carrying it for you while you play on your buttons. <laughs> We were talking about this, and I do carry these big harps around. I was at a wedding that was half an hour walk outside of Sydney. I'll just walk with my downhill on my back, and it was fine. It was no problem. I carried my harp all the way across my college campus every day for a while. I've been playing the Rosemary Harp, and I've taken it on a half hour bus ride on an ordinary public service bus without even a case, just wrapped in a sleeping bag. It's fine. Is it just anybody who's saying anything to you? <laughs> anyway, so, so, so this whole portability thing is absolutely rubbish. If you want portable, play the tin whistle. Do not use the harp. No matter what. Okay, James. Um, I, I've been getting used to playing mullet masses and hop on that one. Mm. And so I'm kind of used to the full fullness of the yes. sonority. And actually, to me, it also feels like it has more dynamic range. I can play really quietly and really loudly then, yeah. and lots of things in between. Oh, good. And you, did you feel the same? Um, the I played the downhill a little bit, and then just, just, it just seems less to me. Right. Less possibility. But I think the bigger half, the bigger yeah. the sound box, yes. the bigger the resonance. Yes, yeah, exactly. so good. Sylvia. Yeah. I haven't actually heard them on last. You should have yeah. squeaked for a good amount of them. Oh, no. <laughs> but um, I think, I don't know what we were saying there, but there's a straight spacing on the archway and the walls moving. I think that gives it greater clarity than the, the mm -hmm. sometimes the, the downhill and the modern mass sound a bit buzzy to me. Yes, there's this interesting thing that if the strings are closer together on the same boards, yeah. the, the wood is vibrating yeah. differently than if the strings are wider apart on the same mm -hmm. board. I've not really thought about that before, mm -hmm. but there might be something in that to change yeah. the voice of the heart. Yes. You tell me. Yes. Um, string between and. Um, um, a spacing is between a string and a string is um, uh, equal or non equal. And um, um, my height half is very big, and uh, string spacing is non equal. Yes, so, it gets closer and closer. Yes, it? yes, yeah, yes. It's crowded, 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 yeah. close. And uh, so my uh, short. The archway and the most windy. Yeah. The archway, especially because it's low, you know. I try, I try and play the base of the archway and try and get a hard sound, and you kind of. Yes. Yes, that's true as well. We didn't talk about that, but. Mm. But there's a general idea that you, you could sit on a seat this height or maybe this height or 
but we all just pass them around and they work. Okay? So, so it's clear that these hubs are designed as floor hubs, there's no faffing around with stools or stand, you don't really have to faff around with seats, although you have a preference for what way your seat mm -hmm. is, it subtly changes the dynamics of it. But there's also this thing about fingernails or tips, mm -hmm. that the norm in the 18th century was playing with fingertips. Dennis O'Hansi had the downhill hub, and he was a male player. He was very grumpy and old-fashioned mm -hmm. by 18th century standards, and yet he had the downhill with fingertips. Um, mm -hmm. We don't know who the half fellow was who had the mullen mast harp. Some people think it might have been Charles Byrne, because the, the mullen mast harp might be the harp in the sketch, and the sketch might be of Charles Byrne, although I doubt both of these things. But it's possible. But it's possible. But Charles Byrne, for sure, was a fingertip player. I was going to ask about that because the mold mask, to me, has you know has smaller spacing than. Okay, there's an issue with the mold mask. With our mold mask replica, it's, oh, really? it's that it's got too many pins in the neck. Oh, okay, okay, okay. then that makes so the my spacing, my especially in the base, is too okay. narrow. Right? Okay, because I was looking at that from here, I was like, that looks so way that, narrower so, than this. So it, it, isn't that, even even if you put the correct, if, even if you took out one of the pins and reshuffled it to make it correct. It's still a narrow space. I was just saying, is it because it's too many? Because I, I thought it's that one extra like, that it, like, it curves up somehow the way that yeah. it's more than this. On the original mother mass tower, and this, this is just faults in, in the measurements, so, so it's you know, lack of data, and, and we've got more data but only after this is made. So in the original, it comes up to here, and then it turns shallower, and there's one fewer. So the whole distribution of the pins. Is more spread out and less extreme in the base. <coughs> well, hopefully, in future ones, this will be rectified and we'll get, we'll get an improved, an improved disposition on that. It's all a learning process. Every every instrument you make is going to, every instrument you commission is going to be obsolete six months later because the act of making the copy throws up all kinds of research questions, which then people go and answer and prove that you made all the wrong decisions. That's completely normal. <laughs> That's the way it works. If you're going to if you're going to commission a replica. Historical Irish half, it will be out of date and wrong within a few months of it being completed, and that's just part of the game. So. What about your Queen Mary? Where does that stand? Or where are you talking about? We haven't gotten to the medieval yet. Well, let's switch to medieval, <laughs> seeing as we're halfway through the session, okay? So let's get rid of all these 18th century halves. They don't exist. That's fit the purpose. There are, we only have two it's copies of the medieval halves here. This okay, we, well, well, we can talk a little bit about Barbara's as well. Okay. But, but Barbara's is modeled after the same harp that my one is modeled after. So these are representatives of these two are representatives of the Queen Mary harp and the Trinity College harp. And this is the Trinity College harp is the one that's in the long room in Trinity College in Dublin, and we'll see it on Tuesday on our field trip. And the Queen Mary harp is in the National Museum in Edinburgh, in Scotland. And it's kind of interesting because they are pretty much identical. There's a lot less difference between these two halves than there are between all that collection of 18th century halves. And so partly we don't know because there's loads of 18th century Irish halves. There's probably, there's over 10 different historical instruments though, but there's only the two iconic medieval ones. There's the Lamont half as well in Edinburgh, which is a third one, and some people think it's medieval, some people think it's 17th century, we can't say without it being dated, so you have to bear it in mind, but unfortunately we don't have one here in the building, so we can't compare it, so we have to stick with these two, which are the iconic medieval harps. But they really are very similar to each other, they've got the same number of strings, they've got the same shape, the same, they've got the same kind of decorative scheme, they've got the same ergonomics and everything. Do you suspect that Natalie's is bigger than the one Trinity? Yeah, so, so, so mine is a strict archaeological copy. Everything about it is copied as exactly as possible from the original as possible to do. And it was made by a sculptor, not an instrument maker. So he, so, so he was copying it as a sculptural object, so copying all of the curves, the shapes, the profiles, without worrying about whether it would actually work or not. And then he gave it to me, unstrung, and my job was to get it working. And part of getting it working was getting Natalie and Octorat to recut the inside. Because you see, this, this, is, the, this is the research question. Mm -hmm. is, is, uh, I took David Patton to the museum and we stood and we looked at the original, but we couldn't have hands-on access to it and we certainly couldn't pull the back off to see what was inside. So we had no idea 
about the inside profiling. So he erred on the side of being a little bit too thick because we said we can always cut some out later, but if you cut it too thin, you can't add it back in. Well, I commissioned this replica, and one of the spin offs of this was that Carol Loomis was motivated to do the work because, because making this replica threw up all these questions what is the wood? What is the profile of the sound board? So off Karen went, did a PhD at Edinburgh University, put the original heart through the CT scanner, generated fantastic amounts of 3D measured data, all about the profile in the wood density, she did the x-ray analysis of pigments, all this kind of thing. And so I, in my archaeological way, said, well, I'll change it and make it better then. And so, so she's oh yes, the pigment on the front is, is definitely, uh, it's got mercury in it. And so it must be vermilion, so I bought a tube of vermilion paint, which only cost me hundred pounds, and painted <laughs> the vermilion on the floor filler, which is this outrageous fiery colour. And, um, and then she generated soundboard thickness maps and the shape of the inside, and I went, oh, so that's what Davy should have done. And so I took the heart to Natalie, and she had the half a part on her workbench, and she had the computer with Karen's, with Karen generated 3D videos of the inside to show us the subtle arching of the top part of the same board and the contour maps and that was in the case of that tool. So she had the computer and the half on the workbench side by side and was copying and she took this out of it. She, she, she carved quite a lot of wood from the whole of the inside of the same board the to thin it up and show it. I mean pull the back off. Yeah, I see, I see. So my aim is still that this is this is as accurate as possible despite research improvement. Yes. <laughs> and, and, the, and, the, and the most satisfying thing was that Karen took, managed to get wood samples taken from the original heart and did um, species identification. And she gave a presentation at Scarlet Groucho a few years ago about her wood identification, which is on YouTube. And, the, and Davy and I had chosen Willow for the same box because we thought that was the most likely. And she, Karen identified, after that, Karen identified the original as Willow. 100% certainty. <laughs> and Davy and I had chosen apple wood for the curved limb for the front pillar because we thought that's what it kind of looked like. And Karen in her uh, timber ID couldn't tell if the original was made of white beam or apple because they're so similar to each other under the microscope. So I was very satisfied by that. And I'm less satisfied about our choice for the neck, but Karen hasn't identified it yet, so I'm in the clear yeah. still. <laughs> and when she does identify it, it proves me wrong. Yeah. I'm not sure I've got the will to yeah, have a new neck made, that's too much. <laughs> but we keep fiddling with it. So, oh, so this is from right here. Sorry? How old is that now? 10 years old. 10. Mm. From 2006 to 7. Mm. So April Fool's Day, 2007. Mm. Like <laughs> 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 My heart is younger than yours. Hmm? By a month, or is no, two. This one is 20, mm -hmm. streaming date is 21st of uh, June. Oh, well, yours is a more sensible heart, mine is a more foolish heart. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this heart here is made by Natalie as a, as a simplified student version. And so you see it has no other carving, it's not pieced together properly, it's got a built up sound box, it's a little bit chunky shape. So her aim was to copy the measurements and the dimensions. And I'm not sure if she's slightly chunkified the upper works to, to give it structural strength to, for use as a student instrument. But, but, the, but the overall ergonomics and shape of it is, is correct and the string lengths and spacing is absolutely correct. So, it's so this is probably sure. about Trinity Harp, yeah. Because and then and the data on the Trinity Harp is much less, we're much less certain about that. And this raises these questions mm -hmm. like with the Mother Mask, there's a massive lack of data and the work needs done. Okay. Now Barbara's harp was made by her harp maker in Poland and is, a, would you say it was an approximate copy? It was an approximate copy based mostly on what, what is in Armstrong's heart of Ireland. Yes, but Armstrong's like measurements of the Queen Mary heart are yeah. pretty good, because that's what we used for mine, you see. Although, so. as far as I know, the string spacing in the base is a bit narrower than yeah. yours. Well, there's always, there's always a bit of fudge factor, you know, unless you have the CT scans or the laser scans. So, I would like everybody to pass around and try these two, not least because these two are in my suggested medieval tuning with the Sisters of Middle C, which I gave a presentation on last year. So I want you to try the two medieval harps that have medieval tuning and pass them around. And we have fewer of them, so you have to pass them around much faster. So exactly. off you go. Please. 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 Please.
So have a go. Hands the blind blue half ever been scanned? No, the blind blue half is another name for the Trinity um, College. Yes, yes. This is the copy of it. No, it hasn't been scanned. Yes. 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 No. No. So there's a huge lack of data. Didn't I, didn't I say that? Oh, yes, it could be. Yes. Because it's a physical object yes. that is complete and has everything in it, but we just don't have the data out of it. So and that's why it's that. that. Well, because nobody's done it. So we want to do it. Oh, we want to do it. But so you see, Karen Loomis did her PhD at Edinburgh University and spent seven years in Edinburgh working very hard, very closely yeah. with the university and with the museum and with the university's clinical imaging facility and with all kinds of external yeah. consultants. It was a huge bureaucratic project. Mm -hmm. and, and, it, and it was a full-time work for seven years and the end result was her thesis and the CT scans. Yes. So I suppose the answer is somebody needs to, 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 have to do that amount of work yes. at that higher level. Yeah. And also, it's a bit easier to that the in National Museum and yes. the yeah. so, there's, there's so many. You need so much funding, you need so much sort of diplomatic bureaucracy to help, to, to, get, to get people to help, to get them to agree. I mean, the amount of bureaucracy to get the museum to agree to take a sample, to cut, to take a little scalpel and cut into the medieval woodwork and take a piece away that's going to be destroyed. I mean, the museum was having kittens. It took them about two years of meetings before they agreed to yeah, do sure. it. Yeah, sure. So, where did they cut the wood from? Parts from each. You know, they had, like, you had, had meet, meetings and then another meeting a month later to decide where to cut the wood from. And then you had another meeting about who was going to cut it. And you came to a meeting about what brand of scalpel you use. Do you know where they cut the wood from? Yeah, inside the side box. And inside the back of the pillar, there's a piece of damage. So they choose areas that are damaged for compliment. And then they move inside the side box up to the base of the tenon and up from there. And then they move the base of the tenon. Yeah. So you You'll see there's this really interesting thing with the medieval harp that you can, you can play it sitting on the floor and the harp rests on its foot on the back left hand corner of the soundboard. And we talked in the sources class the other day about how the original harps have wear in those places, showing that this is how they were played. And we looked at, at stone images of the old harpers from medieval times, showing them kneeling or sitting on very low with the harp in front of them. And think about the medieval world, you know, ch 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 dining chairs are not medieval style, they're 18th century style, so you're thinking of the context, and you can also think about the repertory, you know, it's easy to imagine the repertory of the 18th century house, you have Caroline, you have Connellan, you have you know, Hamsey's Jude, all the bunting songs, everything you've been hearing, the Siobhan's and Anne's concerts, and the stuff that you'll hear at James's concert tonight. But what's the repertory of these harps? This these hearts weren't used for Caroline, and you know, that's not what they were designed for. They come from the medieval world, so we have to think about medieval harp music. What are medieval sonorities? What are medieval tunes? What are medieval styles and idioms? Musicians 
to this day sit on the floor. And I think at some point there was pressure on them that they should rest tonight and sit up on chairs. And they said no, because their entire playing technique is based on the instrument here. Or some of them sit like this with the instrument here. Indian classical musicians. And they sit on a two raised dais like this. I was, I was reading recently about um, an Indian classical musician who played the cello. Because violin and cello have gone into Indian classical music. And she said she came from classical Western cello. And she said it was her first lesson. She took her cello in and she sat there with her cello on its spike and her teacher was sitting on the floor. And as she was saying, try this style. She tried it and it didn't it kind of didn't work. It's just like, how did you how does this work? Do it again and it didn't work. And she said in her second lesson, she sat on the floor, she was like this cross legged and had her cello. On the floor, and she said, oh, yeah, it's easy. <laughs> <laughs> so these kind of things are important, I think. Yeah. Who hasn't had a go at the medieval house? These two yes. But these are more historical. Yeah, yeah. yeah. medieval. Yeah, try out. Try out. Sit on the floor if you want. Sit on the sit on your seat. And... Yes, that's right, yes. The, the dog makes up is more slender than the other things, yes. I've been spoiled really. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. 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 So what did you th actually I need to get that back? <laughs> <laughs> this is a handout for people with photographic memory. <laughs> So, so your next assignment, I'll give you a blank piece of paper and you have to write out that uh, I guess this side is supposed to be quite boy. <laughs> okay, um, we're going to go around the room and everybody is going to say something interesting, intelligent, useful, true yeah. and witty. This is what I usually okay. play. Okay. Barbara. Did you try these two? Uh, yeah, I think yes. Uh, no, we're going to go around the room and we're going to say things because yeah. we're running out of time. Yes. Barbara. I'm afraid my heart would be obsolete, but it would be also like my little bit fine. <laughs> also, uh, I like how it, how it sits when it's on its corner and, and the curve. Right, Tisha. <laughs> well, I found, uh, because I've been playing with that one. This is, is your heart, the week, yes. I like that the spacing is more regular in yours, that's what I found. Oh, right, yes. yes. Yeah, and that helps, really, because this is very narrow. It scrunches down to the Interesting. Interesting. Okay. And then oh. the sound of yours is incredible. It rings forever <laughs> and it gives you a sense of antique that, that I love. Na Natalie is a good heart maker. Oh, sorry. <laughs> she did, she revoiced it. So yes. Because at first it didn't have sonorous top tone. John. It's just a more intimate, more, more simple for a smaller group, a yes. smaller gathering. Really. Oh. The big hearts sort of open out and demand more people yes. to listen, I think. That's interesting. Um, um, I found that quite chappy just for the moment I had it. Uh, I think the sound and the weight of that are both uh, perfectly ergonomic and beautiful. Yeah. Thank you. Mary, I feel like is why I started playing this song. Yeah, <laughs> that that part, I, just, like I love it so much. I love the video stuff. And when sitting on the floor with that one, just like you said, it feels right yeah. for me right now. Well, I can't add anything. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Well, except to say that I do regret the narrowing in terms of the physicality. Yes. However, I mean, for, for, I think for men with fairly large hands, I think it's unfortunate. Um, but it's an interesting you can comment about the, the variable string spacing on all the harps, yes. medieval and 18th century. So that's interesting that there's something about the old tradition that has a variable string spacing. Mm -hmm. And so. <coughs> Then you think, oh, is that a modern expectation that it's even? Yes. And that's interesting. Mm -hmm. yes. so, and sometimes I've thought it's like the difference between navigating your way around a modern city, everything's geometrical and mm -hmm. and navigating your way down country lanes where you wind and mm -hmm. the fields open out and the hills. And, yes, yes. You know, it's definitely a completely it's different central framework which you take yeah. for granted. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 Um, I found that more intimate as well, especially sitting on the floor, which is the first time I've done that. And it kind of feels wonderful to have 
Like the heart, the heart part of you is very, really much more feels controlled to me than balancing the big thing. So, so yeah. Well, I think with all that as well, because I, I love sitting on the floor. I love, and I can't do that with the odd way. And that bothers me in my house, so I have to change, mm. just especially to play that. <laughs> um, but it makes it more um, pronounced, because like, I don't have the repertoire for medieval arts, and, and yet I was playing a small part for a long mm. time. And I feel the difference now, playing the baby. Yes, and um, um, Nakoti's position is different for Yes, and, yes. Um, I was, I, see, I, I was not just thinking that everybody talked about the economics, but nobody mentioned Nakoti in the same <laughs> yes. So, yes. Mm. yes. And what did you think of that? And, um, the, why? And the reason of Nakori, the position is different, is I, I don't know, I don't, and there's no idea for me, but I um, am <laughs> so, um, okay. the C, and um, is Z. Uh, why? Okay, the reason for having Nakori in a different position is lots of reasons. I'm going to give it a, an hour long talk at last year's Skarni Glasha, which you can read in my paper in a music performer, which I believe there's a copy in the library here, and you can see on YouTube in my video from last year. And there's lots of reasons that point to Macaulay for C, middle C on the medieval harp. One of them is that medieval music has to be flat, be natural. And another is to do with the harp being smaller and wanting to, to map the 18th century Irish harp tuning onto the medieval harp. And one of them is the idea of dual pitch standards, G or C. But you can get all this in my paper and on the YouTube. We don't have time to do another hour's lecture inserted into the middle of this little workshop. But this diagram is a handout from last year. And it shows you, it's my attempt to show you, the relationship between the 18th century Irish harp tuning that you have on the big harps and the medieval tuning that I've suggested since last year. And so you can see that the medieval harp is basically a fourth higher than the 18th century harp, which is the upper fourth, and that matches the medieval gamut, which is in the, the theoretical range of notes that medieval music theorists used to, to categorize and write medieval plain chants. Simon, I have a question. Yes. Your medieval harp, you have B natural, B natural, B, B natural, B Yes, you can, edit, you can edit B natural, B flat. Thank you, Barbara. That's very nice. Yeah, B yeah so, it's, so it's a funny, it's, it's, it's an error in the sheets. Mm -hmm. It should be so B natural, all, B all flat. All three places. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. So you can see that the, 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 you can see that you've got, I've put Macaulay up a fourth, but I've put the, the shifting sharp natural up to flat natural. Pronoun, the gap in the bass. The lowest note of the medieval scale is the G, which maps down onto bass D and the big harps. So actually, this the medieval harp doesn't even go down as far as the 18th century harps, even transfers up a fourth, which is interesting. So and it goes up to that high G though? I didn't test, so I don't know. Oh wow. Cool. This is the high G. The Queen of the has the high A, it has 30 strings. You have to look at So this is pronoun C. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that matches a fourth up from. Okay. So I think there's lots of musical implications for this kind of for, for this. And it's, so we have the ergonomic contrast of the 18th century harps and the medieval harps. And that, because of the physicality of the strings and the, the legs and everything, that translates into this musical contrast. And it's not just that, the, that I've made the medieval harps of transposing up and forth, it's also that what people were talking about, that, that the sound is different, that the 18th century harp has a big swelling sound, the bass is so resonant and rich. John said that the 18th century harp commands that the attention it's, it's a dramatic, bold, sonorous instrument, whereas the medieval harps are... It's more introverted. It's more introverted. Mm -hmm. The medieval harps have that high, shrill sound. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the top end of the 18th century harps is... Um, okay. 
Okay? It's kind of delicate and singing, whereas the top end is the medieval harps. It's got that real hard, biting edge, especially when you think of the medieval tradition, his finger, finger nail playing, and the 18th century tradition, his finger tip playing. And you think about the spacing being narrower on the little harps and wider on the big harps, and the wide spacing encourages finger tip playing, it encourages putting more flesh onto the strings. So we mentioned this growliness of bitingness that you get from the closer strings where they're closer together on the soundboard and the wood is less free to resonate. But the wooden surface that vibrates is much smaller. And so the, the smaller soundboard will emphasize higher harmonics, shriller and harsher aspects of the sound. Whereas these really long soundboards will emphasize longer, more deeper resonant harmonics in the sound of the harmony. Can I ask a question on string? Um, Natalie and others did you continue to make strings uh, and, and string them without the gaps. I mean, is this you know, the gaps? well in the in the base? You 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 yes. you you're, you're playing like the whole thing diet. The, the thing the thing is strung diatonically. Yes. Um, but I think you have these gaps. Yes. Um, is that in order to facilitate playing you know anything simple stuff as well? Um, or why why doesn't why then just not? Okay, so so can we use Barbara's harp as an example? Yeah, because yeah. because Barbara is. So, such a slow and useless student, you have to go to the bottom of the heart because bottom of the class. <laughs> so, so, so some of us have harps on the brain here because, because she has a uh, copy of a medieval harp set up in 18th century tuning. That's me, and I play with my fingernails. Yes, so, 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 but I can't really complain about you because up until a year and a half ago, that's exactly what I was doing. So, uh, it's, it's what everybody was doing. So, so. So, so until a year and a half ago, nobody really. Well, people had thought about it, having Nicole in Middle C. I talked to Alice Cardona about it, and he suggested it to me over ten years ago. But I never did it. I could never crank myself up to take all my gold strings up and change the string. <laughs> but he learned how to play the harp again, and I finally cranked up and did it at the beginning of last year. So Barbara has, like I used to have, Nicole at Middle C. G, I call it a G. And Cronan is the lowest string of the harp. And completely missing those really interesting and important bass notes. Okay. So, and, and you'll hear, because the, the, the thing is, you see, that because it's a small medieval harp, it has the medieval sound box, that, this yeah. small thing. There's something... There's a subwoofer the, missing. The, yeah. the way the strings are speaking in the 18th century tuning is matching the way the sound box is responding in its medieval way. Do you see what I mean? Yes. So, so, and there are makers still making an offering this because there are people who learnt on this minimal half of 18th century setup and they don't want to change. And that's fine, they don't have to change, they don't have to be archaeological <laughs> extremists like some of us. <laughs> <laughs> so, but, but that's why you'll still see, and in this, in this school, we've still got, we're still renting out medieval halves. With, 18th, with truncated 18th century tunings, truncated the bass and extended the treble to fit it in a medieval frame. Would you be able to play the Queen Mary in the same range down the end, just to show? So, so here's, here's, here's Barbara's harp. And this harp has gold bass to try and get the 18th century tuning working on the small frame. Here's my harp. The quality is much higher. And these are all silver bases. Yeah. And I haven't decided yet whether, whether these two are too tubby and need replaced by gold. And so I'm on a long term experiment to see <laughs> if I can get away with silver bases for the Queen Mary harp. And of course, it's a completely unfair comparison because the wood of 
the same board mm. is different wood made by a different maker, kind of a different principle, so it's completely unfair to compare two different hubs like that. The only way to do it is to compare the same hub. And I did that when I re strung my hub, and I YouTubed it before and after, with exactly the, in the same room, with the stool in the same place, with the mic in the same place, same equipment, same everything. So you can go on and see, and see it before and after, before and after I re strung it. You can see this gold base and the Corlea G, and then you can see it a week or two later with the silver base and the Corlea C. Can you explain, please, to me the difference? Between silver cover, is it? Silver no, pure silver wire and, and pure gold yes, wire. Yes. Yeah. So the gold is heavier mm -hmm. and softer. And so the same length and the same note, mm -hmm. the gold has a much richer sound mm -hmm. than the silver. And people that have them are much richer than people <laughs> No, the other way around, Bob. The people that have them are dirt poor because they spent all the <laughs> 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 